worship at First Christian Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, here in Swansea, Massachusetts. Welcome here in person, online, on cable. It is indeed good to be together. For this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pass the peace together. Peace be with you. May God's peace be with us and flow through us and sustain us today and always. I invite all who are willing and able to rise for this morning's call to worship. Creating God, blessed are you, and blessed is this time and place. Thank you for your people gathered here. We are here, being the church. We have not retreated. We are standing in praise. Reconciling Redeemer, you are the mender of our souls and the healer of our broken bodies. You lift us up, strengthen and sustain, nurture and nourish, heal and help. Holy fire, ignite a new spark in the heart of each one gathered here. Light our way, warm our bodies, inspire us to speak a new word, to offer the power of prayer, and to sing a song that will bring you glory. Let us worship today. Our opening hymn is Glory, Glory, Hallelujah, number two in your black hymnal.
This time I invite children, youth, anyone feeling young at heart to come forward. All right, I have a question for you. Who here has played hide and seek? You played hide and seek? All right, so how does hide and seek work? So a bunch of people go and hide, right? Yeah, and one counts. And one counts. <laughs> so it counts to see until they go and hide, right? And then what does that one person do? They got to look for them. They got to find them. Okay, so do they just sit in one place and look for them? So if I told you all to go hide and I just sat here, how would that work? It'd be very hard and I wouldn't be able to find you. Exactly. Exactly. Now today, in the scripture, Jesus talks about a bunch of sheep. And a man has a hundred sheep. Right? That's a lot of sheep. Can you imagine? A hundred sheep? And one gets lost. Hiding somewhere. What is the man going to do? He's got 99 in one group and one that's lost. What's he going to do? You think he's going to leave the 99 and go look for the one? What do you think? Get the next farmer to go look. Get the next farmer to go look. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> yeah. So there are all these sheep now. If the, far the farmer leaves the, one, the 99, he's got to count on them to take care of themselves, right? Yeah, they've got to take care of themselves. Maybe they set up sheep watch or something. I don't know. Will the neighborhood watch for sheep? That's what the dog. There is no dog in the story. Sorry, or no me either. Just sheep. But yes, the man goes and looks for the one that's lost, and that means leaving the nice, sheep, safe place in with all the sheep and going out to the wilderness to find the one that's lost. That's right. And so that's what Jesus wants us to do too. Sometimes we leave our safe homes or our safe neighborhoods or our safe churches. And we go out and we try to find people who are lost and bring them to safety. Whether that's lost because they actually got lost, whether it's lost because they don't feel like they belong anywhere, we go out and we find lost people. We bring them back here. That's what we do as a church. It's pretty important work. And I know you all can do it too because you know how to play hide and seek. So we get to go be the seekers. All right, let's pray. God, grant us the courage and the ability and the love to go help seek the ones who are lost and bring them home. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's first lesson is from Psalms 139. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say surely the darkness shall cover me and night wraps itself around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed me, my inner parts. You, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. Here ends the reading.
morning. morning. Today's second reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. By the time a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently, the Pharisees and religious scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. Jesus said, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after one, the lost one until you found it? When found, you could be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing and when you get home, call on your friends and neighbors and saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Or imagine a woman who had 10 coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors. Celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Kind, excuse me, count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul returns to God. Here ends the second lesson. Maybe the day, maybe the season, or just the phase in your life when you realized that God was pleased with you, that God loved you as the divinely created person that you are. Maybe that day hasn't come for you yet. But I know, as the scripture tells us over and over and over again, that God is pleased with you, with me with us. God knows us. God knit us together in our mother's womb. Now, not necessarily just the bones and the organs and such. You notice the psalmist talks about knitting together our innermost part. Well, ancient Israelites, they didn't feel like the soul and the feelings were in the head or the heart like, they, like we do. They believed they were in the guts. So, God knit together our guts, which also means our spirit, the true person that we are, our being full of lightness, an ultimate reflection of God's self. We are God-shaped and God-formed and God-loved. No matter where we go, through life's storms, in moments of joy and accomplishment, in the dark night of the soul, on the brink of crisis, in moments of anger when we swear off God altogether, there is, however, no place we can go where God is not. And that's a forever promise. To the ends of the earth, to the very depths. No matter where we are, we are never alone, never without God. And there's nothing we can do as humans to make this not true. It can feel like a threat sometimes, but only if we are in our teenage minds slamming doors and yelling, Leave me alone! Did you hear that once Jesus walked into a bar and saw a man sitting alone with a glass of water? And Jesus asked him, my son, are you a believer? And the man shakes his head, no. And with a wave of his hand, Jesus changes the drink, the glass to wine. 
Well, my son, do you believe now? And the man frowned and again shook his head. The next day, Jesus came into the same bar, saw the same man with the same glass of water. My son, are you a believer yet? And the man shakes his head no, and Jesus waves his hand, and the glass is changed again to wine. Well, now, my son, you surely must believe. The man frowns and again shakes his head in frustration. The third day, Jesus enters the bar, approaches the same guy and says, My son, are you yet a believer? The man looks up and says to him, If I say I believe, will you please just leave my vodka alone today? <laughs> The divine just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and loving on us. Always, from before we were even born, from the depths of the earth, the psalm tells us, until we move across that mysterious threshold into life beyond death. Except what if you've been told that that love, that divine love, that amazing love, persistent love, is not for you? That you are not acceptable in God's sight. That you must have changed something essential at the core of you to be acceptable. That God hates you or damns you or finds you disgusting. This is a common experience of being gay and wanting the love of God. To be forced out of one's faith community, banned from a sanctuary, which until then it said everyone is welcome. To be forced into an exorcism which violates body and soul from people who said, well, they knew best. To be pulled back from the edge of suicide when in the middle of the night it could have gone one way or the other. These are real stories I've heard in the course of my ministry. And these stories have broken my heart the most and made me the most angry of all the stories I've heard. Not just because I am also part of the LBGTQ plus community, but because it was all so avoidable so wrong-headed about God and caused so much needless suffering to so many people. There are so many people I've counseled over the years before they were brave enough to come and try God again, or rather try church again, and have thankfully found their way to a place where they could be truly welcomed. But there was a lot of suffering before that. And to finally find a place to be not just welcomed, but affirmed. So, we stand on the fact that we're created in God's image, period. Straight or gay or in between or neither, our sexuality is inherently part of who we are as human beings. This isn't, we can love you even though you are gay, or despite your being gay, or just don't talk about being gay. This is, you are loved as a human who loves other humans in ways that are both spiritual and sexual. You were created by God, like God, as a child of God, period. Your existence as a sexual being is affirmed just as your eye color or your laugh or your ability to knit or play cards or to love. Today, as a congregation, you will vote on whether to adopt an open and affirming covenant. Now, covenant is the foundation that we build upon in our tradition. A covenant is a sacred promise. God made covenants throughout our biblical stories, and we covenant with God to love God. We covenant with one another to live as a community, as a church. We, as this congregation, have a behavioral covenant that guides us on how to live with one another. We covenant with our neighbor UCC churches in our national setting. Covenants are not forced. They are not law, but rather are solemnly or sometimes even joyfully chosen. They are a sacred promise. An open and affirming covenant specifically says that a congregation will welcome and affirm LGBTQ plus folks into the life and work and love of a church. First is welcome. Now I have told you all many, many times that you are great at welcoming. Really, it is your strong suit. And if somebody makes it to our front door, they will meet five people before they're able to get back out the door. And they'll have at least one, if not three, invitations to coffee hour. You are really good at this. You welcome. It is a gift that you offer to those who arrive here. A great gift. And actually not all that common. But then there's the second part, affirming. And in many ways you are good at this too. 
There are those here who do identify as LBGTQ, and they are affirmed in who they are, as they are. They are loved by this congregation. They're given roles in leadership. They're welcomed as couples, just like any other couple. And they're just as liable to be asked to be a scripture reader or help to serve at the veteran's supper or be a godparent as anybody else. We don't have categories of who is and is not acceptable in this church or in the, any particular roles. Some of you came from other communities of faith where it did make a difference who you were or how worthy you looked from the outside. Perhaps if you were divorced, you couldn't serve in certain ways. Or if you served, you know, if you celebrated secular holidays that made you less worthy, or if you were gay. To be open and affirming is to say to the gay community, we welcome you in. We see you as just one more person, equally gifted and equally flawed as the rest of us. And we affirm you being here as a child of God, created in God's image. Now, for someone who has searched, and searched for a faith home, who's been damaged and kicked out, that is a gift that is more than you can imagine. There's another part of affirming as well. It's one thing to affirm the people who make it to our door by some word of mouth or mysterious miracle. But to affirm also means making an affirming statement in our community. How will LGBTQ people know about this church unless they are lucky enough to know one of you. How will our community around here know that not all churches hate gays or hold up hateful signs at pride parades because they can be the loudest of our Christian brethren? How will they know they're somewhere different unless we state it out loud? How will people who are looking for a loving, affirming Christian community know unless we go beyond these walls and show them you know, that can sound a little scary. In my ministry, I have heard many a question, sincerely, that maybe being open and inviting and public might make us a target, might bring violence our way. And you know, yes, that is a possibility. Remote, but it is a possibility, absolutely. But I ask you, if we are envisioning what the targeting and violence that we fear is like, Imagine our LGBTQ plus people live with that fear of violence every day. So if a member of our community is worried about that, wouldn't we go and stand with them in solidarity, affirming them in the face of the hate that comes? In today's parable, Jesus talks about a shepherd who loses a sheep, one sheep out of a hundred. So Jesus doesn't put a sign on the sheepfold and the gate says, lost sheep welcome. <laughs> no, Jesus goes out and looks for the sheep, seeks the sheep, risks battling predators for the sheep, believes the sheep is worthy of being sought. Now the metaphor breaks down a little bit if we equate gay people with sinners and Jesus going out to get the sinners. But remember, who defined that they were sinners? It was the Pharisees. They were mad because Jesus was hanging out with disreputable men and women. Well, who on earth is that? Disreputable in the eyes of the Pharisees. Well, I'm not so sure they are our most reliable definers. <laughs> so yes, because the people in power say one is disreputable it does not indeed make it so. Especially those women, you know. Hanging out with women, that was a bad idea. But even so, in the next part of the parable, it's just as good. The woman loses a coin, one out of ten, looks for it, sweeps for it, searches for it, and then celebrates with neighbors when it is found. You see, the affirming part of open and affirming is not passive. It is not limited to this room or this building. The covenant, should you decide to pass it, is not something that stays dusty in the bylaws. It means going out looking. It means going out affirming in the wider community. It means going out and saying, we care. We love you. We seek you. You know, I've been interviewing with churches lately, and just as an aside, I will be going to Braintree. That's my next, uh, that's my next gig, so I'll be going north instead of south. <laughs> 
But I've been interviewing with them, and one search team I was talking to, they, I asked them what they've been up to, and they said, well, yes, this past year we passed ONA, but so far it hasn't worked. I asked, what do you mean it hasn't worked? And the folks, very earnestly, good, kind people said, well, they haven't shown up yet. <laughs> Ooh. Well, the gay people, of course. <laughs> Meaning that the church had faithfully studied and worked and had conversation and done the whole process, just like we have, and passed the ONA covenant and thought the work was done, that gay people would just arrive. <laughs> like a parade, like the bus, you know? It doesn't work that way. Affirming is an active, God-filled process. Sort of a step two, if you like, and one that Reverend Bob will be taking you through, actually. And it matters. As I was thinking about this, I read a sermon on a UCC website by another pastor, Reverend Detra Evans, and she was reflecting on the ONA covenant, and she wrote, we have to affirm. Affirming is so important. She says, I don't want to row all the way out to Gilligan's Island every Sunday and say to the castaways, we accept everyone, no matter where you are in your life journey, you're welcome, and then go back to our land of abundance, leaving them still marooned out on that island. I want us to invite the people on the boat and to make as many trips as necessary to bring them out into a place of security in the bosom of God. My work isn't done until I can tell God who I helped save. And when someone takes that sometimes terrifying step across the threshold of our house of worship, we need to be prepared to repair, heal, and set them free. And even if that person can't walk across that threshold alone, we need to rescue them and help erase the harms done. We need to show them a different Christian than the ones they've ever known. Yes, that voyage can be risky and scary, and we know storms may come, but it also be, be smooth sailing. As New Englanders, we certainly know that weather is unpredictable. But we also know that God knit us together and knew us before we even arrived here, that we are made in the image of God, and that if only all folks, particularly LBGTQ folks who have heard the opposite for so long, knew this same truth, well, they might go from being lost to being found. May we be those seekers, those messengers, those beacons and bearers of love. Amen. I invite all the women able to rise for our next hymn. It's called Seekers. It is on the insert in the book.
We gather together to pray, seeking one another in the comfort and solidarity of pray as one gathered people. So let us come to a time of prayer. So oh, Jesus, you ask us to follow you in this path of life, to seek a new way that may be different than the ones others have trod around us. You ask us to leave security, the benefit of the 99 behind, and to walk out into the world of uncertainty looking for the lost. You ask us to bring to you the lonely, the weary, the oppressed, those who are in despair, those who are looking for a home, those who want to connect with you. Jesus, you preach this message over and over and over about the love of God that is so abundant there is no end. The heights, the depths, to the farthest edge of the dawn, God is there. And that we, we are created in God's image, just as you were fully human, yet fully divine on this earth. Help us to be brave and courageous in taking risks. Help us to reach out a hand to those who are in fear. Remind us of the joy that we find in this place gathered together that strengthens us for each week ahead. We thank you for the blessings of being a congregation that is alive and full of the Spirit. We thank you for the blessings of the ministry that is done here in your name. Ministries of feeding, and laundering, ministries of helping veterans, ministries of care and concern and outreach, ministries of clothing. Jesus, you lead us forward. Help us to keep an eye on you and what you hope and will for the world. Before we look out on a world that is torn by violence, we pray desperately for the situation in Lebanon, Israel, Gaza, Iran, Yemen. We pray that war may not expand, but that cooler heads may prevail, and that some kind of peace may be found and brokered in a place so scarred by war for so long. We pray for Ukraine and Russia connected in this protracted war that seems to have no end. We pray for Sudan, for the half of the population facing starvation is that country, that nation battles amidst itself. We pray especially for the hostages that are still being held as we mark tomorrow, October 7th, we pray for their families. We also pray for our nation. A month away from a huge election, as rhetoric seems higher and more fractured, help us to seek again the peace peace between neighbors, peace amidst our family, peace amidst divergent points of view. That when we look ahead to what it means to choose a leader, that we think of you, Jesus, working with the poor, seeking the lost sheep, helping and feeding and tending and loving. We pray for all who are recovering from the devastating floods from Hurricane Helene and for the families as the death toll rises and rises. May we think about how we can be partners in resilience around climate change to work with this amazing earth that you have gifted us with as stewards. 
We pray for our families, for friends, for all who are near and dear to us. We thanks that prayer grounds us to the great love of God flowing through us and around us always. We pray. Amen. things that we offer is not just the money, though that's important, but also the gift of our voice, the gift of our time, the actions that we do to serve a God who is so great. And so I invite you to this morning's offering.
Let us pray. Thank you, God, for these gifts and these givers. Use what we have offered, our time, our tithes, to seek the lost, to bring about your kingdom in this time and place. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Communion is a time where we most demonstrate what it means to be included. Everyone is invited to this table. Everyone in our tradition. We have an open table. So whether we know you or we don't, whether it's your first time or you were baptized here, this table is for you. Everyone is invited. Jesus opens this table wider and wider. That's what his ministry was all about. It went beyond the Pharisees and the scribes. It went beyond his disciples. It went to those disreputable men and women that he was speaking with. His table just grew and grew until everyone was invited. Even 5,000 people plus women and children sitting on a hillside with fish and bread. All people are welcome here. And not just welcome, actually affirmed because we are made part of Jesus' ministry of love and healing and reconciliation. When we take the bread and the cup, it strengthens us to go out to find the lost, whether that's at our workplace or in our neighborhood or half a world away. Here, we are part of the great we, we the church, going out to be Jesus in a world that desperately needs us. And so I invite you to come. To come and be fed. To come and be reminded that you are indeed loved and perfect in God's image. To come and be reminded that you are asked in return to go out and to love. So come to this table. It is spread for you and for me. Amen. I invite you to join in our response.
Jesus, gather up all these prayers. As we pray to you in the prayer you taught the disciples, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Given all of your sins, we are indeed the love and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. supper was finished, Jesus took the cup, offered thanks to God, blessed it, and gave it to them, and said, take, drink, all of you. This is the new covenant poured out for you and for all generations. And so we take this bread and this cup and remember Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And so, my friends, this is the bread of life, the cup of blessing. For you, for all of us, forever. Amen. Will those serving as deacons please come forward? Come, for all things are ready.
and seek the lost, knowing that you are always found. The God of fierce love, the Christ of never-ending devotion, the spirit of blazing light be yours this day and always. Amen.